Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, we've read this. And, and I, I was going to move on this morning. And so yesterday while we were driving home, um, I was thinking about the message and was going to move on to spiritual wickedness in high places. And I had some notes, I think, already on that. Um, but on the way home yesterday, um, my wife was reading from a book that I will tell you about shortly. And it stirred me up. And um, what was the name of that book? Uh, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give the name of the book, and I'm not going to give the author's name. Uh, mainly, two reasons. Number one, I promised this lady that any disagreement that I had with what she believed didn't have to be personal, and that more than likely I was going to do a podcast or some teaching or something um, against what she believes in and what she is trying to convey to other people, I'm going to warn people not to follow her. And uh, I said, but it doesn't have to be personal. It's not a fight between me and you. It's a fight between what's true and what's not true. And truth doesn't choose sides. You either choose truth or you just remain in darkness. But truth is truth, no matter who believes it, and no matter who doesn't believe it, truth is still truth. And there's no truth, I, I use this phrase a lot, there's no truth like Bible truth, amen? So if the Bible says it, then it's right. If somebody else contradicts the Bible, they are wrong. And that's just how I see it. And at one time, this lady that uh, I'm referring to would have believed what I just said. But she no longer believes anything from the Bible. At least that's what I could pick up from what the book says, what her book says, and what she said to me uh, to my face. But as my wife was reading excerpts from her book yesterday, um, I thought, you know what, that, that works with what it is that we're studying in this series, this sermon series, dealing with the four types of spirits that you and I wrestle with every single day. You're going to deal with one of them or two of them or three of them or the whole army is going to show up. And trust me, this is God training you to learn how to do warfare. What good does it do if we sign up 10 million young men to be soldiers for our army and yet we don't train them to actually fight any of our enemies. They must be trained. We used to have in this church a man by the name of Buster Montgomery. One of my favorite men. I love this man. He was a World War II veteran. And when, uh, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, it made him mad. He left the farm that he grew up on. He was 17 years old. He went down to the recruiting center. And lied about his age, told him he was 18. They just accepted him. They didn't ask questions. They needed, they needed hot-blooded, um, straight-shooting American boys out on the front line. So they didn't always ask the age or try to prove it. But he was 17 years old and he said, I'm going to go fight for my country. And uh, boy, that guy blessed my heart. But he, before, when he signed up, before he ever went... They had to stop and they had to train him first. Train him to do a horrible thing. And that is take another man's life from him in order to maintain the freedom and the liberty that we enjoy here as Americans. So anyway, it's a fight. And God has you learning how to do warfare. That's what this is all about. But as she was reading from this book, it just dawned on me, man, I've got, I've got at least one more sermon out of this. Finally, my brethren, Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Don't forget that. The things that you see on the news, there's more to it. Things that relate to politics in this country, I guarantee you there's more to it. 
There is a spiritual battle for this country and for the hearts and the minds of the people of this country. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers. Here it is. This is what we're going to deal with this morning again. The rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual. There's the key right there. He hits that fourth thing and he mentions that they're spirits. Spiritual wickedness in high places. I mean, it was bad enough when the American people and the Democrats finally had to admit that Bill Clinton used the office of president to have girls brought into him, mainly Monica Lewinsky. It was bad enough that we had to endure that as a nation. That this man in the highest position of power in our country used his, his influence, his power, his prestige, used that to get women, and not just get women, get them in the Oval Office of the White House. We had to deal with that. That made me angry as an American. That there was that wickedness going on in the high offices of our country. And there's probably worse than that going on. But it's worse when you get into the spiritual realm. It's far worse. Now, uh, Hebrews 6. Now, I don't have this in mind. I mean, when I walked up to the pulpit, boom, this came to me. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. For this, is the, for this will we do, if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once... What is that word? What is that word? Enlightened. What word does it have in the middle of it? Light. I was waiting for some of you to say, Gutend. Well, you were close. It has the word light in it. That means that you have been given light. Even if temporary, you've been given light. And have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away. That phrase, fall away, is exactly... The phrase that you see in 2 Thessalonians 2. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. It's the Greek word apostasia. Apostasy. It's where we get it. If they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance. In other words, salvation is no longer offered to them under any circumstances. None. Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Let's bow and ask God's help and blessing on this message. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and I thank you, God, for this church. Lord, it, it was such a joy to walk in here this morning. And Lord, I missed them. I missed everybody last week. And Lord, I was trying to watch a little bit online. I thank you, Lord, for the man of God that you sent to these people last week. I pray, dear God, that their hearts were filled and Lord, that they were blessed. I pray, dear God, that you would uh, bless Brother Chuck, Lord, in his ministry and his his evangelistic uh, ministry, Father Lord, that many souls would be saved, hearts would be, uh, would be mended. Lord, uh, people who are backslid would be brought back to you. And I pray, dear God, that you would just bless him. The devil has a target on him. I know this, Father, because I know me. And I know other men of God, Lord, and I know the devil hates them. They hate, he, they, he hates the preaching of the word. And he hates men who stand for the word of truth. And I just pray, dear God, that you would just put a a shield or a hedge of protection around him. May his shield, dear God, of faith quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless us here. This is our church. This is, Father, it's, we're either going to make it or we're not. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would teach us how to fight. Teach us that once we have been enlightened... Father, help us to never, ever walk away from that light. People have done it. 
Saul did it. Others have done it. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that we wouldn't be next. But, Father, Lord, you would hold us fast in your love and in your mercy. And, Father, that you would add to the light that we have been given. And make that light shine to us. And then, Father, make that light shine out of us to a very, very dark world. But if we be enlightened, Father, let it be, Lord, for those who live and walk in darkness, God, that they may see the right way from us. Father, this man that called this week, that now has been, apparently, Lord, he's, his mind has been awakened a little bit to your word. And God, I'm very thankful for that. And I pray, dear God, that you would bless him. And God, that your word would not return unto you in his life void. But Lord, you sent it out to save him. And I pray, dear God, that you would save him indeed. And I pray, dear God, for these that are here this morning, those that are watching online, I pray, dear God, that you would enlighten their hearts and teach them, dear God, to walk in that light and be children of that light. Bless your word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, So we're fighting against the powers of darkness, principalities and powers and ruler, rulers of the darkness of this world. I, we covered... Um, not last Sunday, but the Sunday before last, we covered basically the, the fourth day of creation when God put all the lights up in the sky. We know that there's a greater light that rules over the day. That's Christ. And Christ is, the, he said, I'm the light of the world. And we are to walk in his light. Uh, if any man walk in that light, Jesus gave us precious promises. If we will stay in that light. So Jesus is the light of the world and that he represents the sun. Or let's say the sun represents him. Jesus lighting this world and lighting this earth. And when Jesus shone the light into your life and showed you the sins that you committed and showed you that there was a penalty for those sins and that penalty was going to be everlasting condemnation in hell and everlasting suffering, you made the right choice in saying, I don't want that. I don't think that hell is going to be some ACDC big party where we're all going to have a big weenie roast and serve Satan down there and get drunk. I don't believe hell's going to be that way. Amen. I believe what the Bible says. There's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so God showed us the light, the light of the scriptures, the light of his word, the light of Jesus. And we followed it. But then there is the lesser light that rules over the night, the moon and the stars. They are, they are light that can be seen, but they're not enough light for us to see our way. In other words, I used to, <laughs> used to scare my kids every now and then. We'd be driving home at night, and I'd turn the headlights off. Doing about 60 down A Highway. <laughs> Dad, Dad! I'd turn it on and just laugh. That's, that moon and that stars, they look pretty, but they're not enough light to show you the way, are they? They're the lesser lights that rule. The Bible says they rule over the night. So in that, we see the stars and the moon as like emblems of Satan and all of his angels that are fighting against Michael and his angels. Aren't you glad that Michael wins? Amen? God wins. I'll say it that way. So I want you to consider this walk in darkness and what, uh, what it entails. Turn your Bible to Exodus chapter 10. While you're turning there, I'll tell you part of the story. We got our table and we set up uh, there on Friday. And um, once we got everything set up, there were some people that were coming in uh, Friday that um, uh, were looking at the various things on the tables and so on. They're, what they're really looking for is free stuff. Well, we have a whole table full of free stuff. So that, you know. And so we gave them pens and we gave them, you know, different things. And we gave them, we, they took the DVDs and they put them all, they bunched them together. It was like seven discs, something like that in a bundle. And they would tape them a little bit so they would stick together so that when Olivia or Lisa or uh, Brother Will Fant from uh, Columbus, his, him and his wife, they, they came down and Will helped us out so that when they uh, picked up one DVD, they picked up a stack of them. They were all grouped together and we'd hand them to people and, People say, no, I don't, I don't want to buy those. Olivia say, no, it's for free. It's for free. You need to take one. I guarantee you, you didn't walk out of that room without DVDs in your hand. 
And, um, but there was a, a lady that had set up a table just sort of diagonal from us. And I really wasn't paying much attention. And I think it was, I think it was Olivia that said, Pastor Mike, you need to go look at her table. And look at the book that she has, that she's offering. I said, okay. I went over there and I read it. There, I read the back of the book. And what I saw there was enough for me to know who and what I was dealing with. The, the woman sitting across from there, I, I won't give you her real name. So I'll just, I'll, I, you know, I make up names. Uh, the guy that uh, we met at MUFON last year. Uh, whose real name he asked me not to give out his real name, so I've not given out his real name. Uh, so I gave him the uh, pseudonym of Jack Webb. Okay? Well, this lady I'm going to call Belle. All right? And um, so I went over to her table and I looked at her book. I flipped it over and I read the back of it. And I found out that she was a Southern Baptist preacher's wife. And her husband then, a Southern Baptist preacher. And I read on the back of her book how she has left all of that behind and took her husband with her. That's what really got me. Was that she not only fell herself, she took her husband with her. And... I am just, I marvel at any man who could, and this, and it wasn't like this guy just fell off the tater wagon overnight. He had been a Southern Baptist preacher and part-time pastor for years. And I marvel at how a man, a supposed man of God, could preach the gospel, preach the truth, preach the word of God, for years, and then in just one event in their life, immediately reject every bit of it and turn his back on all of it. I marvel at that. And I'll tell you what it does. It puts a little bit of fear in me. I'm not above being led astray. Get that in your mind right now that you're not so high and mighty with God that there is no chance that you can be misled. I wouldn't think that way. If I, I don't think that's a good way to think. I think that you ought to be circumspect as you walk and be aware of the constant danger that surrounds you every single day. Somebody say amen. It's been more than one time that the devil's tried to talk me out of giving up or talk me out of what I'm doing today. And so, just so you know a little bit about her past and where she comes from and as we talked I knew that she was familiar with all the things that I was saying to her because of her background she knew the Bible she knew the verses she knew the doctrines it wasn't that she was ignorant of these things or that she forgot them she just simply walked away from them because in her view she found something better than what God has. And I'm here to tell you there is nothing better than the old rugged cross. Amen. Exodus chapter 10. This is the kind of darkness that I'm talking about this morning. Exodus 10 verse 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand toward heaven. That there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. I wondered this morning. I just wonder. If there isn't a blanket of darkness that is about ready to fall over this country. I mean, for now, there's still enough people in this country, I believe, to make sure that the light still shines. But I think those days are drawing to a close. I won't get into all I know about artificial intelligence or things of that nature, but I can tell you that the more power that we give to artificial intelligence, the more of a God it becomes over mankind. IBM, Google, Apple, Microsoft, all of the big Samsung, all of the big technology firms are using and experimenting with artificial intelligence. 
And already people are asking artificial intelligence systems around the world things of a religious nature like, is there only one God? Or is there multiple gods? Or what is a God? They're using artificial intelligence to give them a robot's answer to the truth. There's only one way that you're going to know the truth, and that's from the word of truth, the Bible. Say amen. amen. Only one way. So Exodus 10, verse 21. The Lord, Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. Even darkness, look at this, which may be felt. Now I can't comprehend that. I can kind of imagine it a little bit. But I believe the Bible. I believe that it was so dark that you could light a lamp or a candle, have it in front of you. You could feel the heat from it, but could not see the light of it. I believe that's how dark it was. It was a darkness that was so thick that it had substance to it. It had matter. Anything that's felt is material. That means that darkness has matter attached to it. And did you know that science agrees with that? There is an area of physics where scientists will study what's called dark matter. It's right here in the Bible. Dark matter is matter, darkness that can be felt. And so the people there in Egypt were feeling the darkness. Their hands, as they moved their hands, would feel resistance to their hands and their motions. They would light a candle or a lamp. They would feel the heat, but they could not see the light from it. And I submit to you that some of the people that you know, or maybe you were at this time, at, at one time in your life, you were in such darkness that it was a darkness that could be felt and that no matter how many lights, no matter how many Bible verses, no matter how many sermons people listen to, that darkness or that light could not pierce that darkness. You have the light there in front of you. You just can't see it. And that reminds me of the cross of Calvary. How Israel had the light of the world right there on the cross, right in front of them. But they were in such darkness that they couldn't see the light of this world. Isn't that something? So Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven and there was a thick darkness. Notice that phrase, thick darkness. So, and let me tell you why I'm underlining this. I'm going to read to you verses here shortly that's going to tell you that the day of the Lord that is coming is going to be a day of clouds and thick darkness. So if you think that only the Egyptians back in Moses' day saw these things happen, I'm here to tell you that your Bible just informed you that a worse darkness is yet to come. And in that case, the stronger the light is in your life, the better off you're going to be. And what am I, what light am I talking about? Everybody do this. This is the light, is it not? Thy word is a, unto my feet and a light unto my path. So in the day when the world is experiencing material darkness, darkness that can be felt, thick darkness, when the world is experiencing that, it has no effect on you whatsoever because you have a light that shines brighter than the thickest darkness there is. Amen! I would even say this, you have a light that can shine out of the thickest skull that there is. Amen, Mike Hoggard! There was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose, from any, neither, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel, look at this, had light in their dwellings. That is a picture, your dwelling is your house, it's your body. 
the dwelling place of your soul and the dwelling place of the new man that God has formed inside of you. And I guarantee you there's light inside of you, the light of God's word. Isaiah 29, 15. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. Notice they're hiding or they attempt to hide their deeds from God. Believe it or not, people think that they can, people still think they can run from God. People still think that they can hide their purposes and their, their wishes and their desires away from God and that God cannot see them. But I'm here to tell you that when it comes to darkness, the Bible says God sees darkness just like He sees light. There is no darkness that's thick enough and deep enough that God cannot see in it. Who in here has ever heard of black holes? Do you know exactly what happens down below the rim of a black hole. You know, they have that black hole and you have that swirling of the stars around it. They say there is a black hole in the midst of our Milky Way galaxy. And beyond what they call the event horizon, which is like the lip, the edge around the top of the black hole, that once you go down into that, because of gravity that's so strong, gravity has the ability to bend light. We actually have pictures from the Hubble telescope and the Webb telescope where we can see a galaxy behind a black hole because it bends the light of the galaxy around the back black hole so that we can see it on the other side. I'm telling you what, our God's a powerful God, amen? He made all those black holes and He can undo them just like that. But down below the event horizon, down below the lip, of the edge of that black hole is absolute darkness and it's so dark it sucks stars in it sucks whole star clusters in and yet the light from those stars do does not have the ability to escape that darkness but I'm here to tell you friend you get the light of the Word of God in you it'll shine through any darkness you see I've been telling you I've been trying to plead with you for the last month Think about lost people. Think about people that you know that's unsaved. Think of, think of the worst person that you personally know. And how deep they are in the sin. And think of that person that maybe a long time ago you gave up on. And think, well, they'll never get saved. I said the same thing about my brother-in-law. And yet, lo and behold, he's in heaven now before me. God saved him out of horrible darkness and if God can save him and if God can save me I'm sure he can save anybody because his light shines through the worst darkness that there is but they hide their counsel from the Lord and their works are in the dark and they say who seeth us and who knoweth us ask yourself the question when you when you find out that somebody you know has been living an adulterous lifestyle and you think, well, that, that was just a thing that happened to them and surely, you know, it'll, it'll be okay and they'll be fine, their marriage will last this or whatever. Then you find out that they've been doing it for years and have kept it hidden. That kind of changes things, doesn't it? It amazes me that people who try to justify their adulteries, justify their hatred, justify their drunkenness, justify the sins in their life, they will always say that there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. And yet, if there's nothing wrong with what they're doing, why do they always try to hide it from everybody? And I don't know, maybe. Maybe if you, some of you sitting here, maybe some of you listening online. Maybe somebody somewhere that's listening to my voice is living a double life. Whether it's adultery, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs. No matter what it is, you're living a double life. And you've gotten pretty good at keeping the secret part of your life secret so that nobody finds out about it. But the truth of it is, the light always outshines the darkness that you lay over your sins. And you might think that because nobody saw you do it, then it doesn't count. I'm here to tell you, God sees it all. And he's got an angel. Hey, angel, come here. You see John down there? 
Write this down. Wait, you wait till you see. Wait till you find out what I just saw him do. And all of a sudden, you're going to show up in heaven one of these days on Judgment Day, and that angel's going to say, God, here's his book, and it's this thick. <laughs> Ezekiel 8, 12. In fact, turn to Ezekiel. <clears throat> Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. If you get to Daniel, turn back. Ezekiel 8. Ezekiel 8. Oh, wow. Ezekiel 8. God takes Ezekiel on a tour through the temple. He says, Ezekiel, they, they've kept this hidden from everybody. All the people in Israel think that the temple is the holy place and that all these priests are there doing holy things. He said, I'm going to show them just how evil that things are going on inside that temple. I'm going to show the world just how evil that is. And God takes Ezekiel and he takes him through a, a place in the, in the wall and he shows him things that are going on inside the, the, the uh, tabernacle or the temple structure itself. And then he takes him uh, through a door and he has him look at a hole in the wall and pe he's peeping through a peephole and he sees abominations going on in a deeper place inside the temple. And then he says, let, let me show you, let me show you worse things that are going on there. And Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 12, then he said unto me, son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel, you know who the ancients are? The elders. Listen. I mean, it's one thing when somebody in their youth does wrong things. They're young and they're finding out what this body can do. How much it can drink. How high it can get. How many exploits it can have and so on. But when the elders who sit in a church, when they're bad... It's a whole another strain of sin that they're guilty of. See, the elders are the ones generally who's running the church. And I've seen, I've seen elders work in absolute shameful ways inside of their church. Here, I've seen it. In my childhood, we saw it. Melissa and I and mom saw it with our own eyes. So he said, see what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark. Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, the Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. The worst thing that you can do is think that God doesn't see your sin. But he does. Even the ones that you only think of, God sees them. John chapter 3. You know what John chapter 3 is, don't you? That's when Jesus went to, uh, who was that? Nicodemus? Went to Nicodemus' house to tell him that he had to be born again. That just being a Jew wasn't going to cut it. And he goes to Nicodemus, tells him, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, I don't understand being born again. Jesus explains it to him. And then he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And it's in this context that we find verse 19. And he said, this is the condemnation. If anybody's condemned, people are condemning themselves. That light is coming to the world. The light of Jesus Christ. The light of the gospel. The light of the greatest book ever published in this world is the Bible. They have the light published all in this world. Light is coming to the world and men loved what? Darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Now, I'm setting you up to tell you this Story. By the way, see all these pictures? You might want to take a guess at what these are pictures of. Are they a rock concert? <laughs> Hillsong. <laughs> They're churches. Now I want you to notice in every one of these, it's dark. Every single one of them. 
In fact, you find this out when you start looking at other churches and what they're doing. When a church is about ready to go bad, here's what they do. They say, we need a new building. And the reason why they say that is, most churches, traditional churches, are very well lit. This church has always been well lit so that you can sit and read from your Bible as I read along with you, so you know that what I'm telling you is the right thing. You can sing through the hymn books, you can read your Bible. Shoot, I don't mind if while I'm preaching and I've read something out of the Scriptures, if something else slides in your mind from the Holy Ghost and He tells you to go read somewhere else in the Bible, I don't mind if you read something else from the Bible while I'm preaching. I just hope I don't call on you while I'm doing it. Amen. Because, I, I, listen, I don't have a problem with how the Holy Ghost leads you during the church service. As long as it's the Holy Ghost. But you see, let's darken the auditorium. So they get them in a new building program because they're going to rebuild this thing and they're not going to put these lights in. They're going to leave them out. And you can say, well, I don't think that really means that. Oh, yes, it does. You can clearly see that men love darkness rather than light. And I don't even have to know what... And I won't say all of them. I couldn't say that everybody in these pictures is going to hell. I can't say that. What I can tell you is a majority of these people love sin more than they love the truth. That's what I can tell you. And I can tell you that they fit under the category, their deeds are evil. Now, to love darkness rather than light. This pastor's wife named Belle. This was what was written on the back of her book. And when I read it, that is exactly what I thought of. Men love darkness rather than light. She had what she believes was a near-death experience. In other words, she's of these people who believe that they died... And they went to heaven. And here's what's interesting about all of that is that practically everybody comes back with what sounds like the same story, but there are always differences. A lot of times people will go through the light, go find, go through the tunnel to the light, and they'll have somebody who they are told is Jesus. And Jesus then informs them that, well, no, I don't send people to hell. In fact... Everybody gets to come. I've read that before. Somebody with a near-death experience coming back and telling the world. I think the world needs to know that heaven is not an, an exclusive place. That God isn't going to include everybody in it. Only the really, 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 really bad people go to hell. Like Adolf Hitler and Charles Manson and you know, Joe Biden and, you know, the... You know, I mean, the really evil Hillary, okay... Yeah. Um, but that's usually the story. Usually, usually, everybody that comes back with some near-death experience tells a big lie about what's on the other side. There's a book out, I saw it this week, in, in some of these Christian bookstores called 23 Minutes in Hell, where somebody claims that they spent 23 minutes in hell. I don't believe it. The rich man went to hell. His 23 minutes were up a long time ago. He's still there. It is appointed unto man once to die. So this pastor's wife, here's what it says on the back of her book. The author, Bell, reveals the raw and unfettered details of her own chilling encounter in a place of isolating, utter darkness known as the void. You know what the word void means? It means it's empty. And so, when someone voids themselves, they've emptied themselves. If something like a, a check is void, that means there's no money in it. 
And no money comes with it. If someone's life is void of righteousness, that means they don't do anything good. They do evil. If your mind is void of thoughts, then you have created an empty place in your mind. Don't let anybody tell you to do that. Don't do that. She goes to a place where she admits is the void. It's completely empty. The wife of a Southern Baptist pastor, her expectations of a joyous homecoming full of all-encompassing love were shattered when she was instead met with a devastating experience for which she could have never, that's where it's supposed to be been and not be, never been prepared. Fighting to escape the desolate outer darkness. Does that phrase ring a bell with anybody? Outer darkness. Where she had been cast, she would return only to find herself in an equally harsh world with the memories and physical repercussions of death lingering over her as an ever-present shadow. Now, I didn't write down the rest of it, and I didn't tell you all of her experience. But let me tell you what she said to me. I tried to read Job chapter 10. Turn your Bible to Job 10, if you would. I had my phone out. And I was holding it. I was standing there with her. And I had my phone out because I pulled up my Bible app. And I was going to Job 10. I was standing there holding my phone like this. And we were talking. And she immediately, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the moment I opened up my can of King James on this woman, I pulled up Job 10. She, I'm telling you, there was a spiritual change in her she immediately went on the defensive and she looked at me and she said, looked at my phone and she said what are you recording me and i went no i wouldn't do that without your permission i'm simply trying to show you something from the bible what I, here's what i read from the back of your book what you said is exactly what job described in job chapter 10 and I read it. finally got a chance to read it to her. Let me show you what I mean. Job 10. Let me get there. The end of the chapter. Look at verse 20. Are not my days few? Cease then and let me alone that I may take comfort a little. Before I go whence I shall not return. Even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death. That's where she was. A land of darkness as darkness itself. And of the shadow of death, without any order, and where the light is as darkness. I read that to her. And I said, what is described on the back of your book is exactly what Job said about hell. About the shadow of death. The place where there is no light. And I said, it's a place... You called it the void. It's a place without any order. And she said, there was two order. And she said, God was all around me. Helping me. Being with me. I, here's what I'm getting at. She believed that this place that she was in was a good place. She said it wasn't heaven and it wasn't hell it was just a place and she said she tried different things to see what she could see she tried waving her hand in front of her face but she couldn't see her hand and i'm going that's outer darkness and she said that there was a male entity behind her a masculine shapeless, faceless entity. That's Job 4, if you're interested. And she said it was her guide, or he was her guide in this. And he said, you're not going to be here for very long, don't worry. So she immediately felt peace. 
And she said, then we, he, we started flying through this dark place to a place where she saw some kind of light. It was like purplish neon light. And she, I don't have, I don't have it all down, but she referred to this as the fabric of humanity. She was looking at all of creation all at once. And she's like, this, this person behind her is filling her head with all this knowledge and everything like that. And she rather enjoyed this time that she spent in the darkness. But the bottom line is, when she comes out of that, she's angry now because all the things that she had been told about what was going to happen when she died didn't happen. And when she told this to her husband, at some point, they both left Bible Christianity. They both left Christianity in general. And I asked her a question. I said, is there, do you still believe in a God? She said, yeah. I said, do you still believe in heaven? She said, yeah. I said, do you still believe in hell? She said, yeah. I said, um, then who decides who goes there? And she said, I don't know. But Chris, she traded everything that she had ever heard or learned in for a darkness. And not just any darkness. Outer darkness. Yea, the light of the wicked shall be put out, and the spark of his fire shall not shine. The light shall be dark in his tabernacle, and his candle shall be put out with him. You know what place she actually described, David? A place of total nothing. What is that? I know you know the word, you just can't think of it. Nir, 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 nirvana! The Hindu expression of eternal life is a place that is completely void of everything. It is a place of absolute, total, and perfect nothing. And that's where they believe they're going to spend eternity. In a place of absolute and total nothing. To them, that's heaven. But the Bible says, the light shall be dark in his tabernacle and his candle should be put out. Do you know what the word nirvana means? To be blown out as a candle. And there it is right there in Job 18.6. You know what happened to this lady? This bell, this pastor's wife? God went. <laughs> blew her light out. Why? She loved darkness. Rather than light. And she'd rather live in that darkness. Than live in the light. Matthew 8.11. I say unto you that many shall come from. The, this is. Uh, one, two, three times. The Bible, let's see, is it three? Yeah, three times. The Bible uses this phrase, outer darkness. That many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into where? Outer darkness. And that is exactly what she said this place was. It's outer darkness. And then Jesus finishes it and says, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. She doesn't comprehend, but the place where she showed up literally is hell itself. Where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew twenty two eleven. And when the king came in to see the guests, this is the story about the wedding feast. And the king invites the, the people and they don't come. He invites all the rich and the nobles, they don't come. So he tells the servants, go out into highways and byways and bring those in who would come. And so he fills the, the wedding hall with all of these people and he finds one that doesn't have a wedding garment on. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And I'm going to ask you this morning, do you, are you adorned with your wedding garment? You know what the wedding garment is? Revelation 19 calls it the righteousness of the saints. It is Christ covering you and adorning you with His righteousness. Because you cannot get to heaven on the merit of your own righteousness. Somebody say amen. So the idea of having a wedding, wedding garment on is you cannot get to the wedding without having the garment put on you. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into where? 
There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, few are chosen. And this woman and her husband has spent a large part of their life in a church. All to just reject the light that could have came to them by the preaching of God's word. They rejected it. They didn't want it. So God turned them over and cast them literally into outer darkness. Many are called. Oh, I'm sure they had a full house in their church. I'm sure that usually in small towns, especially in the south, you find a Southern Baptist church. Usually it's going to have more people in it than most every other church in that town. They rejected. They were part of the many that were called. But they were not part of the few who are chosen. You need to ask yourself the question, have you been chosen by God? Or do you just think that you coming to church is going to count merits with God? It doesn't work that way. Matthew 25, 28. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him. This is the, the parable where the man gave different talents to his servants. One had five, one had three or two. The other one had one. The one that had the one decided to just take it out and bury it instead of putting it to usury and gaining his master back more than what he gave him. And he said, take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents for unto everyone that hath shall be given and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. It appears to me that God has taken the talent that this woman had at one time and her husband had at one time and taken them away. Because now, well, I can't tell you that. I was going to tell you uh, what position she holds and what, and, ha and what she's a part of, and I can't do that without giving away who it is. But I can tell you that just from reading what of the book I've read, that she has turned herself completely over to familiar spirits. What my wife was reading me on the way home was she was she was going on a discourse about her childhood. She was calling to herself familiar spirits from what age? Five years old. Her whole life, while she pretended to be a Christian, really, she was calling unto familiar spirits. And God said to anyone who has familiar spirits, God said to be cut off and to be cast out of the camp and be stoned, be killed. Saul was killed for inquiring of a familiar spirit. Everyone that hath shall be given and they shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Three times Jesus used the phrase outer darkness. And every time he follows it up by saying there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I want to ask you this morning. Are you playing games with God? You got, you got your church clothes on. You look like you belong in church. You got a Bible. You pay tithes and you give offerings every now and then. You do all the religious things that religious people do. You, and you've got everybody thinking that you're a Christian. But only you know the truth. If the truth has not been denied you. You know the truth that while you... Say you're a Christian on one side, yet you serve and love darkness on another. Your life is full of secret sins, and you seek always and only to hide those sins and keep those sins hidden from man so that nobody finds out what it is that you've got going. That sounds like Achan in the Old Testament in the days of Joshua, where he went into Jericho and stole all the things that God told them not to take. And what did he do with them? Did he wear them out in public? No. He hid them. He buried them. And he put them in darkness so that nobody would find it. And I'm here to tell you that you could be sitting here, amen and me, shaking your head, holding your Bible up in the air, putting a thousand dollars in the offering plate, and you could be lost and going to hell. 
Because you're trying to live a double life. And you won't be the first person I've seen in a church that's done it. I've known preachers that have fallen. Church members that have fallen. Young people. They, they go to church all through their youth. They go to Sunday school. They go to youth functions. They, they're there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. They do all the things, the religious things that religious teenagers do who go to church. And yet the moment that they get out on their own, they turn into a devil. And they have no intention of ever serving God ever again. And I'm just asking you this morning, are you, are you a lover of darkness? What have you got hiding from everybody? And I'm not telling you this so that I can find out all your dirty little secrets. I don't want to hear them. Because if you start telling me, then I might tell you. And I don't want you to know. Do you love darkness more than you love light? You know, there's a box that we have that's full of darkness in our houses. It goes by the names of TV set or computer monitor. And I'm here to tell you that if you'd rather watch YouTube than read your Bible, you're in darkness. If you'd rather watch TV instead of read the Word of God or hear the Word of God preached, you're in darkness. And God needs to bring you out to the light. I can't do it. I can only show you the light, but I can't make you leave. You have to do that on your own with God's help. Let's bow our heads.